A reading from the first letter of St. John. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also must love one another. No one has ever seen God, yet if we love one another, God remains in us, and his love is brought to perfection in us. This is how we know that we remain in him and he in us, that he has given us of his spirit. Moreover, we have seen and testify that the Father sent his Son as Savior of the world. Whoever acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God remains in him and he in God. We have come to know and to believe in the love God has for us. God is love. And whoever remains in love remains in God and God in him. In this is love brought to perfection among us, that we have confidence on the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear, because fear has to do with punishment. And so one who fears is not yet perfect in love. The word of the Lord. Lord, every nation on earth will adore you. O God, with your judgment endow the king, and with your justice the king's son. He shall govern your people with justice, and your afflicted ones with judgment. The kings of Tarshish and the Isles shall offer gifts. The kings of Arabia and Seba shall bring tribute. Lord, Lord, the nation of the For he shall rescue the poor when he cries out, and the afflicted when he has no one to help him. He shall have pity for the lowly and the poor. The lives of the poor he shall save. Dominus vobesco, et cum spiritu tuo, Lexi, Sancti Evangelii secundo Marco, Gloria Tibi Domine. After the five thousand had eaten and were satisfied, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and precede them to the other side toward Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowd. And when he had taken leave of them, he went off to the mountain to pray. When it was evening, the boat was far out on the sea, and he was alone on shore. Then he saw that they were tossed about while rowing, for the wind was against them. About the fourth watch of the night, he came toward them walking on the sea. He meant to pass by them, but when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out. They had all seen him and were terrified. 
but at once he spoke with them. Take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. He got into the boat with them, and the wind died down. They were completely astounded. They had not understood the incident of the loaves. On the contrary, their hearts were hardened. Er kommt vor mir nicht, Well, during these days between the celebration of the great solemnity of the Epiphany of our Lord and his baptism this coming Sunday, we continue our saints' trailblazing, huh? following in the footsteps of St. Elizabeth Ann Seton on Monday, then St. John Newman, the great Philadelphia bishop yesterday, and today a great North American saint, a Canadian saint, St. Andre Bessette, showing us that holiness is possible, sanctification is possible. Remember, when a saint is canonized by Holy Mother Church through her magisterial authority, it's a declaration, first and foremost, that this soul is now in heaven, right? Wrong. <laughs> That's secondary. <laughs> the fact that a formal canonization, the beautiful mass in St. Peter's Basilica Square, uh, celebrated by the Pope or one properly deputed by him, etc., etc., the fact that their soul is being declared in heaven is secondary. What's primary about a canonization mass? What's primary and foremost about a formal canonization and declaration by Holy Mother Church and her authority is that while still living on earth, while still alive, the person lived to a degree of heroic virtue. Maybe not always. St. Augustine with his lust addiction, St. Catherine of Siena with her need to control situations, okay? and those types of things, our faux pas, but at some point they overcame those faux pas, those issues, dependencies, addictions, we could say, and they began to live great heroic lives of heroic virtue. You know, it's very beautiful. It's just before the Gloria at a canonization mass that the official proclamation is read by the proper delegate within the context of the sacred liturgy. And right after the formal declaration during the opening rites, but before the Gloria, when it's solemnly and formally proclaimed that this individual, this man or woman, this young person or older person or a middle-aged person, whoever it is, is being formally canonized at this Mass. After that formal declaration is made at the Mass, the very next thing is the Gloria. Gloria in excelsis Deo. Glory to God in the highest. The great song of praise, the great Gloria, comes immediately after the formal proclamation of this person being declared a saint. How awesome is that? How rich with meaning is that? So beautiful, huh? And today we celebrate a great, great Canadian saint, a great North American saint, St. Andre Bessette. He was orphaned at the age of 12, and as a child was very poor, uneducated, and plagued by ill health. Before entering religious life, however, he tried his hand at many other trades, as a farmhand, an apprentice, a shoemaker, a baker, a blacksmith, and even a tinsmith. For a time, he even worked in the textile mills of the state of Connecticut. Around the age of 25, he entered the congregation of the Holy Cross. As the porter, the doorkeeper, that is, at the College of Notre Dame in Montreal, he became renowned as a healer. He developed a lifelong devotion to St. Joseph, the foster father of Jesus. And St. Andre consistently attributed the many miracles and healings that he seemed to work to the intercession only of St. Joseph. A bit of a longer biography of his says this, long before his death at the wonderful age of 91, People were talking of the many miracles worked through the intercession of the humble lay brother of the Order of the Holy Cross, St. Andre Bessette. In press reports, he was known as the miracle worker of Montreal, of the great and famous oratory of St. Joseph, which he himself founded in 1904. 
But Brother Andre, as he was known, deplored such publicity, and he assured everyone that he had not worked any miracles. Time after time, he insisted that the person's own faith or the intercession of St. Joseph, whom he had a very special devotion to himself, had moved the good God of all creation to action to effect a cure of the person. Brother Andre would often say, I am only a man just like you. To many who came to him for cures, he replied, thank the good God for having visited you through your suffering. If we only knew the value of suffering, we would ask for even more of it. Yet time after time, he quietly said to each person who asked him, yes, I will pray for you. And time after time, the miraculous cures took place. Brother Andre knew also how to speak of the love of God with such intensity that he inspired hope in all those who met him. His portrayal of God as a loving father, his common sense advice to singles and marrieds and to religious, and his empathy with those he counseled, along with a warm sense of humor, were outstanding. Though shy in his temperament, Brother Andre enjoyed a good laugh with his friends now and again. He would often say to them, you mustn't be sad. It is good to laugh a little now and again. When he died on January 6, 1937, at the age of 91, an estimated one million people climbed the slope of Mount Royal to St. Joseph's Oratory in Montreal, where his body lied in state. In the rain, sleet, and snow, on the seven days immediately following his death, they filed past the small wooden coffin to pay their final respects to the little lay brother. Brother Andre was beatified by Pope John Paul II on May 23, 1982, and was canonized by Pope Benedict XVI on October 17, 2010. Now, we know that he had a wonderful and strong devotion to St. Joseph, the foster father of Jesus Christ. You know, the church teaches in pietistic form that, you know, uh, St. Joseph receives protodulia, which means the first, proto first, the first of veneration. Latria is adoration, not veneration. Latria, adoration. And it's given to the three divine persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Latria, adoration. But then we have veneration. We have dulia, veneration. Dulia is given to the angels and saints, okay? But hyperdulia, hyper meaning the greatest of veneration, hyperdulia, the greatest of veneration, goes to the Blessed Mother, then dulia. So the church teaches those three distinctions, latria, hyperdulia, and dulia. But in pietistic form, we find very readily protodulia, the first of veneration among the saints and angels, and that would be St. Joseph. Okay. So that's a nice distinction also to make, especially during the year of St. Joseph. Okay. If you go to fathersofmercy.com and at the home page, click on the magnifying glass icon, a search bar immediately comes up at my community's website. If you simply type in the words, year of St. Joseph on that search bar, after clicking on the magnifying glass, Year of St. Joseph. Two of my blogs, recently written just within the last two weeks, come up immediately. One is titled, The Year of St. Joseph, Some Basic Facts. The Year of St. Joseph, Some Basic Facts. It tells you about the year of St. Joseph, why Pope Francis proclaimed it, what's the reason for it, what do we hope to get out of it, etc., etc. Okay. The second blog is titled, Plenary Indulgence Options for the Year of St. Joseph. Plenary indulgence options for the year of St. Joseph. There's many, many options to gain the plenary indulgence this year. And I won't spend the time going into them individually because they're so well spelled out in my blog. So again, if you go to fathersofmercy.com, the homepage comes up immediately. In the upper right-hand side, click on the magnifying glass icon. It looks like a magnifying glass. Click on it, and a search bar immediately comes up at the homepage, still, still at the homepage. A search bar comes up and simply type in the words year of saint joseph saint would be st period year of saint joseph and the two blogs will immediately come up and one is titled the year of saint joseph some basic facts and the second one is titled 
plenary indulgence options for the year of St. Joseph. Pope Francis announced a year of St. Joseph on Tuesday, December 8, 2020, the Solemnity of the Immaculate Conception, in honor of the 150th anniversary of Pope Pius IX's proclamation in 1870 of St. Joseph as patron of the Universal Church. The year of St. Joseph began on December 8, 2020, and will conclude on December 8, 2021, according to the decree authorized by the Holy Father. The decree also states that Pope Francis established a year of St. Joseph so that, quote, every member of the faithful following St. Joseph's example may strengthen their life of faith each day in the complete fulfillment of God's will. We talked about God's will yesterday in our homily, huh? The decree adds that the Pope has granted special indulgences to mark the special year in honor of St. Joseph. The December 8, 2020 decree was issued by the Apostolic Penitentiary, which is the dicastery of the Roman Curia that oversees the practice of indulgences. Many options to receive the plenary indulgence this year. In addition to the decree, Pope Francis also issued an apostolic letter, also on December 8, 2020, dedicated to the foster father of Jesus Christ. The Pope explained in the letter titled Patris Corde, which the English is rendered from that Latin, with a father's heart. Patris Corde, with a father's heart, that he wanted to share some personal reflections of the holy and just spouse of the Blessed Virgin Mary. He goes on to say, the Holy Father, Pope Francis, quote, my desire to do so, that is to proclaim a year of St. Joseph, increased during these months of the pandemic, noting that many people had made hidden sacrifices during the crisis in order to protect others, just as St. Joseph did to protect the Holy Family. The Holy Father continues in Patris Corde, each of us can discover in St. Joseph, the man who goes unnoticed in the Gospels, a daily discreet and hidden presence, an intercessor, a sure support and a guide in times of trouble. St. Joseph reminds us then that those who appear hidden or in the shadows can often play an incomparable role in the history of salvation. You realize that in the four Gospels, St. Joseph never, ever, ever speaks one word. Never. He's a quiet man, but he's not a timid man. He's a quiet man, but he's not a weak man. In fact, the second to the last title, which I love in his litany, which has 25 titles in his honor, the second to the last title is Terror of Demons. And for those of you who listen to my weekly radio show, Open Line Tuesday on EWTN Global Catholic Radio, I put my radio show each week under St. Joseph's patronage under that title. I always end my show with St. Joseph, Terror of Demons, Pray for Us. I love that title of his. He's called that for a reason that is scriptural, primarily this, that when Herod ordered his army to seek out the newborn Christ child to kill him and all the baby boys two years of age and younger in Bethlehem and its vicinity. And the angel appeared to Joseph and told him to flee to Egypt with the boy and his mother. St. Joseph did just that. He successfully fled. And the demons were ticked off at that. He was provider, protector, defender of the God-man, Jesus Christ, in baby form, infant form and also protector, provider, defender of his spouse, the Blessed Virgin. And then the reason why he's called Terror of Demons, based more on tradition rather than a scriptural reason, is that he's the patron saint of a happy death, right? Chief patron of a happy death. Why? Because of the very, very strong tradition that when he died, he was flanked on either side of his deathbed by the Blessed Virgin and his foster son, Jesus. The devils didn't have a chance to get to him to tempt him against faith at the end of his life precisely because of that. Now, I don't know about you, but when I die, whether it's immediately like through a car accident or whether it's through a slow demise, like through an illness, like cancer, let's say, I don't care how I die. When I die, I want to be flanked on either side of me by the Blessed Mother and Jesus. And I like to add, I want St. Joseph, terror of demons right in front of my bed or right in front of me. <laughs> And I want my guardian angel right behind me. I want all four of them surrounding me, okay? But he's the patron saint of a happy death. 
He's called terror of demons for those two reasons, one scriptural and one more based on sacred tradition. I want to just comb very briefly to, through the different points of the Gospels where we read about St. Joseph. I think it's very important to understand this. We have the genealogy of Joseph and Jesus telling us of the importance of family heritage and lineage in Matthew 1 and Luke 3. The fact that Jesus, or the, the fact that Joseph is betrothed to Mary, which tells us about chaste courtship in Matthew 1 and Luke 1. That the angel visits Joseph in the first dream, which is about trust and faith and readiness for mission, Matthew 1. The fact that Joseph and Mary go to and live in Bethlehem, showing us the father is the provider and establishing a home, Luke chapter 2. Then we have the birth of Jesus and the fact that the shepherds go to Jesus, showing us the reality of Joseph's fatherhood and assuming of the fatherly role in Matthew 1 and Luke 2. Then we have the beautiful scene of Jesus being presented in the temple, showing us the truth of Joseph's fatherly headship and obedience to what? Obedience to God's law, Luke chapter 2. Then we have the fact that the angel tells Joseph to flee to Egypt. This is the second dream, telling us of the virtue of docility that Joseph possessed, huh? During a, a sudden change of plans. You've got to have docility, the virtue of docility when there's a sudden change of plans that come your way, huh? That's Matthew 2. Then we have the flight into Egypt with Mary and, Je and Jesus, showing us Joseph's role as protector and defender. So again, provider, protector, defender. Those are themes that keep coming up. Then we have uh, the angel tells Joseph to return to Nazareth. That's also Matthew chapter 2. Then we have the Holy Family settling in Nazareth, uh, showing us the masculine genius as regards the theology of the Father leading so that there is a settledness, a rootedness, a groundedness of the family, so that the family is solidly anchored, which is important for family life, to be anchored and rooted. John Paul II talks about the feminine genius. I like to talk about the masculine genius. Uh, men as, as provi providers, uh, defenders, protectors. Men are naturally called to a, to a theology of rootedness, groundedness, being anchored. Okay. Women and their feminine genius are, are beautiful in their natural gifts, John Paul II would say, of, of comforting and, and nurturing, uh, and nesting. Okay? It doesn't mean that each gender, the, the masculine and the feminine, the male and the female, can't share in each other's natural gifts. It doesn't mean that at all. Uh, fathers can be wonderful uh, nurturers and comforters and defenders, and, and even a mother, no doubt, can be a provider and, and defender and protector. The, the old phrase, don't mess with mama bear, huh? Don't mess with mama bear. You moms know what I'm talking about. All John Paul II is saying in the feminine genius and all I'm saying in the masculine genius is that the two genders have these particular gifts that are apropos to the gender itself, but they can surely share in one another as headship and hardship. It takes the head and the heart, uh, the masculine and the feminine, to, to make the full body function, and not only function, but function well, huh? Then we have Joseph and Mary finding Jesus in the temple, which shows us the virtues of perseverance and trust in God on Joseph's part in the midst of what? In the midst of fear. We also see Joseph's fatherly strength there. That's Luke chapter 2. Then we have the holy family of Jesus, Mary, and Joseph showing us the beauty of the sanctification of marriage and family life in John chapter 6. And then we have Jesus as, quote, the son of the carpenter, he's identified as, the son of the carpenter, showing us the dignity of human labor and faithfulness to daily duty in Matthew chapter 13. I want to close with a beautiful quote from St. Teresa of Avila. It's probably one of her more prominent quotes regarding St. Joseph specifically. It just sums up beautifully everything that I've said about uh, St. Andre Bessette's own devotion to St. Joseph, uh, the year of St. Joseph, and the fact how we can turn to him and look to these different virtues uh, that we see laid out in the four Gospels that I've just combed through rather quickly. Uh, but St. Teresa of Avila, virgin and doctor of the church, the great Carmelite mystic and Carmelite reformer, huh? she says this, I have never known anyone to be truly devoted to St. Joseph and render him particular services who did not notably advance in virtue. For he gives very real help to souls who commend themselves to him. In fact, for some years now, I think, I have made some request of him every year on his feast day, 
and I have always had it granted. And if my petition is in any way ill-directed on my own part, he still directs it aright for my greater good. Saint Joseph, terror of demons, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. God bless you.